whereby are given unto us. They're, these are given unto us. These aren't, these, these aren't given to the, the, those on the outside. These are given unto us. Now what I'm going to talk about are things that have to do with you. Things that are given unto us. Today I want to extract in a concert with things that are excellent, I want to extract the phrase exceeding great and precious. There are a lot of, a lot of implications to these things. A lot of implications. Um, God's put these together like this for a reason. This isn't just accidental. That he's talking about promises and he has to use exceeding great and precious. This has put him in another category, hasn't it? Yeah, amen. Another category altogether. Now, I'm not going to bore you with some word studies or try to impress you with my great ability to read. So I'm going to attempt to take and open up something that hasn't been written down. See, the things that God gives you as you study, as you meditate on these things, they're not written down. He works them in you. And now the great challenge is to get them enough of it on paper to where you can remember what he gave you. <laughs> That's what I'm going to attempt to do today, is to show you what he showed me along the way. Amen. Now, whereby? Or for this reason, or another way you can say, in light of this fact, or until this is accomplished in you, you can't see that. Whereby? Now, your ability to handle the truth is not in you. See, there, there's, there's men who have written books on hermeneutics to try to get it in you. They say, we can work out a plan. We can come up with a system that if you'll just follow this, you'll understand too. Is that right? So God's not involved in this then. No, see, this is, God, God has to be the one to open these things up. Jeremiah knew this. He said, oh, Lord, I know, we know you're making progress when you know this, that the way of man is not in himself. See, this path that we're walking, he walked it before, not me. If I'm going to make it successfully, I'm going to have to follow him. Whithersoever he goes, he's on the move. He's moving. It's not in man that walketh. Here's the, here's the real catch. To direct his steps. Yeah. We're the ones doing the walking. He's the one doing the directing. Yeah. And if we listen, he'll, he'll actually be successful in leading us to glory. He knows the way. Mm -hmm. We can only contain, contain that part of God that he has prepared a place in us to inhabit. Now, in other words, you can't know more of God than he allows you to know. Yeah. You can't find him out. I can't search out God for you. Yeah. Can't happen. Now consider Moses. He asked God something that was extremely difficult. I don't know that Moses really understood the implications of what he asked. But God knew. He knew. It's what he said. Moses said, show me your glory. Now, it's a big request now. Big request. But see, when you get around God, you ask for big things, don't you? You ask for big things because God's big and you get the sense, I want, I want to see more. And he said, I will make all my goodness to pass before you. How are you going to do this? Well, keep listening, Moses. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to you. And I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, thou canst not see my face. Moses didn't go running down the mountain, did he? You can't see my face for there shall no man see me and live. Now, Moses wasn't disappointed in what he saw. Not at all. But see, God couldn't answer his request the way Moses asked it. He answered it in the way that God could answer it. And Moses could still be alive in the end. And the Lord said, Behold, there is, there is a place by me. Isn't that something? Amen. Almost as though God knew what Moses was going to ask for. And thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock. I'll, 
I've made a place for you that you can see part of me and live. It'll actually be effectual. You can use it, in other words. So whatever we've seen of the Lord, if what we say we've seen we can't use, it's questionable whether or not we've seen it. But what you can see of God, you can use in your life. You can actually, it can actually change you into the same image. So that's what we're looking for in this text is something that's usable. Something that we can take it and now it can assist us in running the race with patience. Making our calling election sure. We are seeing, when we witnessed this this weekend, we are seeing more of God than before. His face, his face is shining. The face of Jesus Christ is, is reflecting the image of God. See, it's from glory to glory. Actually, we've received grace to receive grace. Amen. Yeah. Now, that's how potent this is. you got to have grace before you can receive grace. Amen. In salvation, it isn't God that's changed. Yeah. See, this has widely been misrepresented in the day we're living in, but God hasn't altered his person at all. Yet men, now that's a different story. Men have changed. The glory of God has changed them from one state of glory or, or uh, God's ability to be able to work upon man to God's ability to be able to work in man. From glory to glory. He's given man through Christ the ability or the capacity to hold more of his image. From the very foundation of the world, God's, God's been inclined to do this. And yet, he's always gone a little bit further in each dispensation or each revelation of his person. He's gone a little bit further, a little bit further. See, if he'd have told Adam all these precious promises, he'd have said, what? Now, see, in Christ Jesus, you can receive these things. These things actually make sense to you. What happened? A lot happened. Actually, a lot happened the day Jesus died. He opened up the gates of heaven. It actually made a way for God to be able to reveal himself in a more complete and precise way. Whereby are given unto us, given unto us, exceeding, exceeding great and precious. Now, Peter here, actually the first chapter, he's building a foundation, okay? Another way, he's actually building a stable thought on which he's going to build, build a building. He's going to build something that is actually able to edify you, but it has to. There's not very many men out there that can sustain a thought in the day we're living in. Can actually sustain a stable thought that you could say, I'm standing on this thought that God gave me. I'm standing on it. Now the winds of trial are trying to push me and move me away but I'm able to stand firm because my, my thinking is based on Jesus. Mm -hmm. This is what Peter's doing. He's building something that if you think about it, it'll make you stable. Yeah. Really, these words that Peter's going to say won't make any sense to someone who's outside of Christ. They won't make any sense. They won't be able to get the understanding of what he's talking about. And until you get the understanding of what he's talking about, what he says doesn't mean anything to you. In other words, you'll go right on living your life in total ignorance of what Peter just said. What is that? Well, that's ignorance. See, that the ostrich was deprived of wisdom, right? So you don't expect him to have any. He's been deprived of it. But see, those in Christ Jesus, it's wrong for them to be ignorant. You've been given the capacity to understand God. Amen. In other words, if I read Peter and I don't understand what's going on, I need to run to Jesus. Say, oh, give me understanding. I'm not content to remain ignorant anymore. Amen. Peter's not writing a universal word to the lost. This is not what Peter's doing. He's not attempting to make this truth accessible 